This is Roger Brewer with John Feard, the Hawaii Department of Health. This is part three of a four-part webinar series on the use of decision unit and multi-increment sampling methods to investigate contaminated soil and sediment. In the first webinar presentation, John discussed the importance of systematic planning and uh, gaining a very strong understanding of the site history, and, and including review of in fire insurance maps, historical photos, published reports, even interviewing employees at the site, and especially including a site visit. This is all important to develop a strong conceptual site model of your property before you go out and collect samples. Now, once you have a good understanding of the property, then the next step is to designate targeted areas for characterization, which we'll talk about again in a minute. And then you, after you've designated the, these decision unit areas, or DUs, then you'll collect a representative sample from each DU, have it properly processed and tested at the laboratory, and then you review the data compared to screening levels used in the risk assessment. And this very methodic, systematic approach will help you expedite the investigation and ultimately the remediation of contaminated properties. Now in this third segment of the presentation of the webinar series, we're going to discuss characterization of decision units. Before we do that, let's, let's do a quick review of what a decision unit is and what it isn't. So the best definition of a decision unit is the volume of soil, it could be sediment, water, air, et cetera, that you would send to the laboratory as a single sample if possible. This usually isn't possible, so a representative sample of the DU has to be collected. So in the previous presentation, we discussed source area decision units and exposure area decision units or spill area uh, decision units. So these are very common ideas to anyone who does any field work. When you first go to a property, you specifically look for areas that you suspect could be contaminated, isolate these for individual characterization. From a risk assessment standpoint, we're very concerned about exposure to contaminants, say within a backyard or even in, as shown in the first photograph here, or say an open area of a commercial industrial site where workers are methodically moving back and forth across the area over many years. Same thing for a, a residential backyard. A key point to remember is that the screening levels that are published by Hawaii, the same with US EPA, the regional screening levels, or California's ESLs, they're intended to address chronic long-term exposure. So we're not concerned about individual points within an exposure area. What we want to know is what the true concentration of the soil within that exposure area is, as if you could, again, collect the entire volume of soil and send it to the laboratory as a single sample. And of course, we can't do that again, so we have to collect a representative sample, and then it's very important that the sample capture and represent smaller scale variability within that decision. A big mistake we made in the past, and I say we, I include myself for the first 10 years of my career, was comparing these screening levels that are intended to apply to the, the true concentration or the mean concentration for large areas to individual discrete samples, and that was really the path we went down that caused most of the problems we've been dealing with for the past 20 or 30 years. So screening levels apply to the DU as a whole. That's a key point to remember. They are never intended to apply to the individual discrete samples. Another point we em emphasized in the previous presentation in part two on DU designation was be very careful, spend a lot of time thinking about how you designate areas within a targeted property for characterization. The idea is to get in and get out and really minimize the need and the time and the cost to remobilize for additional investigation. This has likewise been the, the bane of, of a all discrete sample investigation where there's never a clear point, end point in sight. You just basically keep collecting samples until you run out of money to collect additional samples and then try to make some decision. That's a common and unfortunate approach. Under DUMIS methods, you spend a lot of time again up front thinking about the site, visiting the site, talking to people, designating targeted areas or decision units for characterization. And it's important to designate DUs at sizes that you're willing to make a decision on up front. So you, you don't want to designate decision unit and then it comes back contaminated above a screening level or something and then decide, well, maybe I should have subdivided that into smaller DUs after all. So you want to make these decisions 
up front rather than having to go back and do it. Sometimes you do have to go back. You get surprised at large decision units that turn out to be contaminated. And you go back and subdivide them just to optimize your mediation. Again, you want to avoid this as much as possible. So today what we're going to talk about is how to characterize decision units. We're going to focus on discrete versus multi-increment samples and discuss uh, sampling theory. Again, it's, this is section four of the Hawaii's technical guidance manual. You can see the reference in the web page below. <coughs> section four, the 4.1 discusses sampling theory. It sounds complicated. It actually is, can be complicated. There's entire books written on this, but it's in the field, it's not that difficult to implement. And under sampling theory, we discuss the use and misuse of, of discrete sample data and how we're identifying that the discrete sample data can be highly unreliable or much more unreliable than we thought in the past. And then after that, we discuss the use of multi increment samples to more reliably characterize disease units. We also have a section where we discuss the use of discrete, of discrete samples to initially screen a site and help designate decision units. They can still be very useful. And in the last section, we talk about common DUMIS investigation mistakes and problems. I'm not going to cover that today. John's going to include that at the end of his presentation tomorrow, or in part four. There's also a, a lengthy discussion of this in our guidance manual. So I'd like to quote that Albert Einstein, if I had one hour to solve the problems of the world, I would spend 59 minutes on explaining the problem and one minute on explaining the answer. That's really a key part of this whole process and this transition from discrete sampling methods into multi increment sampling methods. The, the first step is to understand the problems with discrete samples and the unreliability of discrete sample data before you move on to a, alternative methods to improve the way you do site investigations with multi increment sample uh, investigations. And again, sampling theory can seem pretty complicated. I uh, like another quote here. I have it pinned to my cubicle wall by Dr. Zeus. Sometimes the questions are complicated and the answers are easy. <coughs> so in the field, it's actually not that difficult to implement DUMIS methods, even though all the details behind collecting multi increment samples can be seem quite complicated. So let's start with the characterization of decision units. Why do we collect samples in the first place? And there's two main reasons. The first is just for site characterization in general, where we want to estimate the extent of contamination that might pose an environmental concern, say due to direct exposure, risk, eco risk, leaching, impacts to groundwater, gross contamination. We're concerned about uh, short term exposure to vapors or free product machines and such. And the, the second the reason that we do site investigation, uh, aside from ex determining the extent of contamination, is to estimate the true or also think of as the mean concentration of a contaminant for a targeted area and volume of soil for inclusion in a risk assessment or for comparison to screening levels, as we just discussed in the previous slides. So again, remember that all data for a particular matter like soil represent an average. So when we say mean concentration for a, a targeted area of soil, what we really mean is the true concentration mean is just it's an artifact of how we were collecting samples in the past using discrete sample data. And the objective is always to estimate the true concentration of contaminant in soil. Again, as if we could send the entire area, volume, mass of soil to a laboratory for testing as a single sample. And again, we discussed in the previous presentation that particle size is also a key part of decision units. Uh, typically, we focus on the minus two millimeter fraction for direct exposure. Sometimes we'll look at the minus 250 micron fraction or even smaller. So a targeted area of, of initially targeted area of, of soil for investigation, it, it may turn out there is no, there are no fine uh, particles in that DU. So there is no DU, even though there's a physical area that you're concerned about. We've had this happen at sites that are very sandy. We worry about direct exposure to fines in the soil. We designated exposure area DUs, went out, collected samples, had them sieved, and there were no fine, there wasn't a fine fraction to analyze. So the DU actually wasn't physically present. Let's look at the origin of discrete sampling methods first. Again, it's important to understand what people were thinking back in the 1980s when they, in a pretty much of a rush, they developed soil sampling guidance. So at this time, you see a map from 1985, ABCD intended to represent spill areas, say within some commercial or industrial property. The dots you see are discrete soil sample points. 
uh, some key assumptions they were making in writing this guidance, and they would include these as caveats. They knew that, that in their sense, they were just initial assumptions. It's that the concentration of a contaminant in released media is assumed to be uniform, so say in dielectric fluid or in industrial wastewater coming out of a plant. This was a reasonable assumption, unless the process is inside the industry or something changed. The concentration inside that media, inside that oil or liquid, uh, should be fairly uniform. This is important because then this means that you can test any mass of the media at any time and any volume sent to a laboratory and you'll get pretty much the same answer if, if you collect multiple samples. They applied this then to soil, so the, the concentration of contaminated in impacted soil of any mass, any volume was likewise assumed to be uniform. So this is important because it meant the collection of a single discrete sample within a spill area was adequate to determine if the contamination is above or below screening levels or posed some other potential concern. <clears throat> so at that time, it was a reasonable assumption. They didn't have a lot of data to look at, not a lot of co-located samples and such. So two important quotes from early EPA guidance. Keep in mind the, imp the implicit assumption that contamination is likely to be uniformly present anywhere within the sampling area is reasonable. So anywhere within the spill area, you're going to find a similar concentration of contaminants in soil no matter what mass you test or where you collect it from. In 1989, methods for evaluating the attainment of cleanup standards, when there is little distance between points, it is expected that there will be little variability between points. So as Dr. Phil might say, how's that working for you? It's been say for me for the last 30 years. So these are very common problems with anyone who's done field work, site investigations or remediation. It's a need for multiple remobilizations and step out investigations with no clear endpoint in sight. Now, something to keep in mind that it's the uncertainty associated with site investigations that creates most brownfields, a lot more than the, say, the, the money involved in cleaning up the property, the remedial process. It's this need for multiple remobilizations. So eventually, the rep responsible party runs out of money or just gets frustrated with the process because there's no clear endpoint and they walk away from it. Or failed confirmation samples, multiple over-excavations, the same problem. You collect some discrete samples, you think you identify where the hot spot is, you dig that out, collect confirmation samples, and then they surprisingly some of them fail. So you dig out a little bit more, collect more confirmation samples, some of them pass, some of them fail. And again, it, the more you dig, the more you test, the more complicated it can get. Another big issue we've had to deal with here in Hawaii is accidental import or export of contaminated soil where a, a few discrete soil samples were tested initially and the soil was presumed clean and brought onto a property and later determined to be contaminated. So you ever wonder, what if I move my sample point over a few, peet, a few feet? And again, a, a discrete sample, by definition, is just a sample collected at a, a single point, typically about 100 grams, something you can put in a four ounce jar. And this is something we always thought about when I was doing field work with discrete samples. What if I move my sample point over a few feet? Would I really get the same answer or something similar? It's really that uniform. And what if the laboratory tested a different aliquot of soil? So here's something to keep in mind. For metals, the laboratories typically only test a half to one gram of soil. That's about a pinch of soil. And a pack of sugar, say in a restaurant, is only about two or three grams. So think how what a small mass that is. For VOCs, the laboratories only test about five grams of soil. That's about enough soil to fit in a, a soda bottle cap. PCBs, pesticides, dioxins, TPH, pHs, about a spoonful of soil, 10 to 30 grams. So when you're going out to a site, you're really testing a pinch to a spoonful of soil and then making a lot of times very expensive remediation, remedial decisions based on that data. So what if I did move my sample over a few feet? What if the lab did test a different aliquot or subsample of soil in the sample I sent them? Well, we wondered about that too. So a few years ago, we went out to the field, selected three sites we knew were contaminated. We had discrete sample data for each one of these sites. In some cases, multi sample data too. Each one of the sites, we designated 24 grid points. And in each one of the grid points, we collected multiple samples, or hundreds of samples at each site, and tested them and looked at variability. Study site A was a site with fine-grained soils uh, suspected to be contaminated by arsenic and wastewater from a facility. So fine-grained soils, contamination with wastewater, we expected the variability or small-scale heterogeneity within this site to be lower than anywhere else. It's kind of an ideal situation where if the contamination was really uniform, it should be uniform here. Study site B 
was a, an area actually I mentioned yesterday as former incinerator where they had taken incinerator ash and, and we think mixed it with fill material and then spread this around the area to level it out. In this case you have small bits of lead contaminated incinerator ash mixed with fill material. So we expected the variability between co-located discrete samples or even within a single sample to be a little bit higher than the arsenic site. Uh, study site C was a former radio station where they had we, known, we knew that they had been dumping transformer oil with PCBs around the station for many years back in the 1950s and 1960s. Again, we had discrete soil sample data at this site to show significant PCB contamination. These areas were fairly small, the smallest 1,500 square feet, the lead site. The others were a few thousand square feet, up to 10,000 square feet. So again, at each site, we designated 24 grid points. And at each grid point, we wanted to look at two things, variability within a single sample and variability within co-located samples. So for variability within a single sample, we refer to this as intrust sample variability. One sample from the site was tested 10 times prior to processing and testing in the laboratory. Uh, so these, for the metal sites with lead and arsenic, we would collect one undisturbed discrete sample at the grid point, and then we would test it five times on top and five times on bottom with a portable XRF. The XRF tests about one gram of soil, so it's very similar to what a laboratory might do also. Now for the PCB site, of course we can't test that with an XRF, so PCB site we collected one discrete sample, but then we put it in 10 separate jars, and it, we're collecting a few hundred grams of sample for each one of these. So we, the PCB site, we would, at each grid point, we take one sample, split it into 10 small jars, and then we had the lab test each jar. Now for inter-sample variability, or variability between co-located samples, again, we, we would take five discrete soil samples at each point, and each one of these soil samples, we would have the laboratory process using MIS methods. So they would sieve them, they would dry them, sieve them, and then subsample them so that the data we got were pretty confident is representative of the actual sample we sent in. So then we get an idea of what the variability is between co-located samples outside of intrasample sample variability. And then we did the same thing for PCBs, five discrete samples at each grid point, tested independently. This, this study was uh, recently published as a critical review of discrete soil sample variability. We published it in two parts. Part one is the field study results. Part two, implications. And these were published in the Journal of Soil and Sediment Contamination by AEHS. The field report, and there's some more detailed report, recorded webinars posted to our webpage, uh, both uh, available. So let's look at what we got. First, here's the arsenic contaminated site and where we expected low variability, and that's pretty much what we got. So this, here we're just looking at the co-located samples, lowest concentration at this particular grid point, 140 ppm, highest concentration just a foot or so away, 260 ppm. Now if you combine the average total variability within samples and between samples, it was about twofold. So what this means that any, any of the 24 grid points at the arsenic site the discrete samples collected around a single grid point can expect to vary by about twofold. That's pretty good from a site investigation standpoint. It might really bother risk assessors. You know, is the concentration 120 or is it 260? Well, from a, with respect to discrete samples, this is about as good as you can get. Let's look at the lead site. And again, we expected a little bit higher vari variability. This was lead contaminated ash mixed with soil, and that's, that's exactly what we found. Here's an example grid point with the lowest concentration around the grid point was 120 milligrams per kilogram. Highest concentration just another a foot away, 300 milligrams per kilogram. So almost a two, two and a half fold just between the co-located samples. There's a lot, of a lot of variability within the discrete samples themselves. So taking that into account, in addition with the variability between co-located samples, the average total variability around any given discrete point at the site was about sevenfold. So if you collected a, say, a, a soil sample and the concentration was recorded 50 ppm for a discrete soil sample, you could move over a, a foot and you might find a concentration of seven times that, 350 ppm. Or if we don't really know what side of the spectrum you're on, you could find a discrete soil sample that was seven ppm. 
So a lot more variability, a lot more uncertainty at the lead site. We'll look at this site again later. Uh, important thing here, and just by coincidence, Hawaii's lead environmental action level for residential sites is 200 milligrams per kilogram. So at this site with 24 grid points, at every single grid point, we could find a discrete sample that was both above and below our action level. So think about that. We could have gone out to this site and just by random chance collected a suite of 24 samples. All 24 samples would have been below our action level. We would have declared the site clean. We could have gone out again, collected another set of 24 discrete samples, and every one of them is above our action level, so the insight is contaminated. So which sample data set did you get at any one time? It's impossible to tell. We'll look at this again later. Here's the PCB site, and this PCBs are a real hassle to characterize in the field. This was more shocking than we expected. So around this example grid point, just looking at the co-located samples first, the lowest concentration, 4.9 ppm, highest concentration, 91 milligrams per kilogram. Now, when we look at this, this doesn't mean that the concentration of PCBs is in increasing as we move from 4.9 to 91 ppm and away from that point. These are totally random concentrations. If we had moved the sample point over a few inches at any one of these, you might get similar concentrations, but in different areas. Here's something really interesting here, that the sixth sample that we collected at this grid point, we took the sample and split it into 10 separate jars and tested each jar separately. So we essentially set, tested a single sample 10 times. The average concentration of that sample was 2,400 milligrams per kilogram. So there's a true hot spot. It really was a spot a few inches across right in the middle of this, this grid point. So the average total variability around any given grid point at the PCB site about 39 fold. So you could collect a discrete sample at a grid site at this site, at a grid point at this site, and the first sample may come up 1 ppm. You move over a few inches, it may be 39 ppm, or it could be 1 39th of a ppm, depending on which side of the spectrum you're on. So a lot of variability at this site. Here's the actual sample we tested 10 times. The lowest concentration, 810 milligrams per kilogram. Highest concentration in the same sample, just a different spoonful was tested. Essentially, it's 5,700 milligrams per kilogram. So amazingly high variability, almost order of magnitude. Key point here, we saw the same variability regardless of the concentration. We saw the same order of magnitude or more variability at high PPM concentrations, at the same at other grid points where we had lower you know, PPB concentrations. So the variability was somewhat independent of concentration, although it tended to increase with higher concentrations. So what's going on at the PP PCB site? The same thing with the arsenic site or the lead site. But here's what's going on at the PCB site. We got a microscope in the soil in detail. If you look real closely, we start to see these small nuggets of dark soil about the size of a Tic Tac. And if you pushed on them, they were easily broken. And you see in the middle slide here. And if you focused in really closely with the microscope, here's what they look like. They look like a Tic Tacs, or I like to think, since we're from the tropics, kind of like roach eggs. But you see this thin white rim around here. They're about one or two millimeters long. What these are is they're fossilized drops of PCB oil that dripped down to the soil, sank into the soil, forming small drops and then dried up. So they're essentially small PCB infused tar balls. So think about the implications of this. If, if a, a key point to remember is the concentration of a contaminant in soil varies with the mass or the volume of the soil tested. That's this is a, a key point with decision units. You have to specify the mass that you're talking about when you talk about concentration. Back to the right hand side of this picture, if we tested this entire sample and checked it for PCBs, we might have gotten very low PPM concentration of PCBs in the sample. If we tested one of these nuggets, one of these little tar balls for PCBs, we'd probably get tens or hundreds of PPM PCBs or even thousands of PPM PCBs. If we could take one of these tar balls and zoom in with a special electron microprobe that could somehow test for PCBs, and we test a single spot on the matrix, eventually we could test a small enough spot where we'd find one million parts per million PCBs. We're testing at the molecular level, even particle level for other contaminants. So that, that was great. This solved a big problem we always had in the past. What's the maximum concentration of a contaminant at a site? Well, that's easy. The maximum concentration, if present, is always 100% if you could zoom in close enough at a small enough particle. If it's not present in that soil at all, then it's 0%. Anything in between, you're just diluting the 
particles with soil, the contamination with soils. So you really have to forget about the idea of maximum concentration within a DU. It's, that's an easy question. It's one million parts per million. And the objective is always to obtain the true or the mean concentration for the specified area and volume of soil. And we see the same thing with the arsenic and the lead site. At the arsenic site, we'd see little nuggets of arsenic-infused iron hydroxides where the arsenic would bind up to small little nuggets of iron hydroxide in the soil. If you tested those, you could get thousands of ppm arsenic, where the soil sample may only have a few tens of ppm. For the lead, if you could zoom in and test individual pieces or bits, pockets of ash, you would get several thousand ppm lead, whereas if you tested the entire sample, 100 grams or even 10 grams, it may only be a few hundred ppm lead. Uh, a chemist who likes to cook showed me this idea, how to make PCB nuggets, or any type of nuggets in soil uh, from an oil. Take some dry uh, flour and pour olive oil on it. Real quickly, you'll see the olive oil beat up here in the upper left-hand corner. And now watch, if you watch the drop of olive oil, it'll beat up and it'll slowly sink into the, the flour. And now look what happens around the edge of that drop, is you'll get a white rim where it's mostly flour there's less olive oil in it exactly like we saw in this PCB nuggets. Now take your flour and sieve it and you see all these little nuggets of olive oil infused flour. So think about this if you're testing this flour for olive oil if you happen to get one of these nuggets you're going to get a high concentration of, of olive oil. If this little aliquot you test doesn't happen to have one of these nuggets then you'll get no olive oil or very little. So we see the same thing in soil. So this is why confirmation samples fail or pass. It's because of small-scale random variability of contaminant concentrations over a few inches or a few feet. The concentration reported for any given discrete sample is really it's largely random within some, some unknown range for that particular spot of soil, area of soil you're testing. So a key thing to remember here is the lab data that you get back are not, not reliably representative of the sample that you sent them. Labs can't homogenize a sample. This has always been a myth probably by a lot of field people laboratories could have told you that. It's one laboratory chemist told me, try sticking a metal rod in a jar of soil and homogenizing it, stirring it. You know what happens? All the fines go down to the bottom of the jar. They take out a pinch from the top and test it. They've always known the process of testing soil samples at a lab was not reliable. And at the same point, the sample you collected and sent to the laboratory wasn't, isn't reliably representative of the area where it was collected. So if you could zoom in, in this example pit here where we put in lots of discrete samples, excavated what looked like contaminated soil. And then you take confirmation samples, and sure enough, some of the hot confirmation samples come back hot. So if you could zoom in and look at where you collected that confirmation sample at the scale of an individual aliquot or subsample lab test, or even a discrete sample, you can see it's highly heterogeneous. So the, the sample you collect or the aliquot subsample the lab test is, is completely random within some unknown range. It may only be a range of two. It may be a range of two or three orders of magnitude. You'll never really know that. The problem can't be fixed by collecting more and more discrete samples. The more you collect, really, the, the deeper you dig yourself into the rabbit hole. This has a lot of really important implications for reliance on discrete soil sample data. Let's go back to the lead site again. Remember at each, here's a map of the 24 grid points at the lead site. Remember at each grid point we collected lots of co-located samples, and then we also looked at the variability within individual samples. So at each grid point, we could make some rough estimate of the concentration of lead, the range of concentration of lead that you would find in any given discrete sample collected around that grid point. So for example, here in grid point 21, based on co-located samples and uh, intrust sample variability, we estimated that any given discrete sample around that grid point, the concentration of lead would range somewhere between 103 and 419 ppm. So we could calculate or estimate a range for every grid point. Think about that, and what we did using Excel is we in, input the, the range of lead concentrations at every grid point, and then we had Excel pick a random concentration from that range for every grid point, and then we made a map out of it. So this is like a, a map from 24 discrete samples collected at this site. So you see, in this case, for grid point 21, Excel picked a random concentration number of 165 within that range. So that was the first round of sampling. What if we went back to the exact same grid point spots, say one square meter areas, and collected another discrete sample? Where we're going to get a different number for each grid point? And this is, here's what happened. And Excel picked another random sample from each grid point. Now look at the map. There's 
very different from the first map, much more larger area, it's contaminated. All of a sudden that clean corner that was 165 ppm, now it's 401 ppm. So think about that if you're trying to use these maps to delineate the extent of contamination at a site. Let's do it again. Here's three and four more maps. So at first, con contamination looked like it's concentrated on the right side. In the second map, it's kind of spread all over. In the third map, it's concentrated near the top of the site. And then in the fourth map, it's different again. And you see lots of other maps. So what this is showing you is that the maps based on discrete soil samples can be completely random, completely artificial. So if you're using these to excavate out hot spots within targeted areas, then they can be very artificial, very unreliable. You can do the same thing with uh, cards. Take a deck of cards and put it at each one of these grid points. And so every deck of cards is the same. If, say we're worried about the concentration of face cards across this site. So we collect a bunch of discrete samples at each grid point. In this case, we're putting a, the same deck of cards at each grid point and then just randomly drawing a card. We map out where the face cards come up. So in this case, I colored aces purple, face cards red, 7 to 10 yellow, and 2 to 6 or, or green. So you'll get a map pattern with any set of discrete samples. Of course, you're going to get some map pattern, but how reliable is that? Let's go back to the same grid points. And now we're going to draw another card and look at the pattern. So now here's the pattern. It looks like we have suddenly more face card contamination and there's a pocket of face cards seemingly toward the top of the site, top of the area. So again, this is these are completely artificial. Every grid point's the same and the DU as a whole has the same concentration of face cards. So there's, there's uh, two more maps, again, completely random artificial uh, patterns, even though we start to see collections of, of face cards and we may think, wow, there's more face cards on the left side of this site than on the, the other parts of the site, but completely artificial. And there's a bunch more. So that's a key point. This is a big realization in our work is just how fooled we can be by single sets of discrete samples. And the whole idea of trying to excavate out a hot spot based on a, a single soil sample. I think we always knew that something was wrong with that. And now this definitely demonstrates that it is. This is what soil contamination could look like, would look like if you could actually see it. Is, you know, when I was in college, I had to take art appreciation class. The only, only artist I remembered, and for some odd reason, was Jackson Pollock, probably because I would end up looking like him one day without any hair. But Pollock was famous for a splatter painting. So I think for our PCB side, if you could actually see the PCBs or PCB oil on the ground, it probably looked like this. It's just splattered on. This red dot is about the size of a, a discrete soil sample. Imagine moving this red dot around this canvas or even on this site and measuring concentrations of black or concentrations of PCB, they'd be completely variable. It's completely random with even a small area what concentration of black or PCBs you would get. On the right is a picture of a, a milk truck that had spilled over and you see the milk flowed over the surface and it's following preferential pathways. You see how heterogeneous it is. So imagine trying to investigate this if you couldn't see the milk, but just putting a few discrete soil sample points out here. You'll, you might find the core of the contamination. That's one thing we see when we go back to sites. We have discrete sample data. If, if the soil is so contaminated that every spoonful is going to be above your screening level, you'll find that with your discrete samples. But once you get outside these super contaminated zones and start getting in a lot of heterogeneity, then you'll get fooled real quickly. You'll hit a cleaner spot and think that you're done, when in reality there's a lot more contamination there that could pose a problem. This is also probably what soil contamination looks like vertically in cross-section think if this was a tank spilling down, leaking down through soil, you probably get these anastomosing channels of preferential pathways, which are very impossible and difficult to predict. So if you're just drilling a few borings down through this and collecting discrete soil samples every five feet or something, again, you could be completely fooled. You might find the core of the contamination, but you could also miss quite a bit of contamination if it's still a problem. So that's the point, again, is that discrete samples really we know now we know why they aren't reliable when we're doing site investigations. It's a simple problem. The, the bottom line is discrete soil samples are just too small to overcome this small scale heterogeneity. It's like in this image I stole from Gary Lawson sitting on the back of an elephant with a microscope and thinking you found a bird. The whole point with the systematic planning and DU characterization is such is to step back and take a, a bigger view instead of trying to focus in on single grams or pinches or spoonfuls of dirt and think about what you're doing in the first place.
again, large scale patterns can be real. And as you see in our guidance, we do use tight grids of discrete samples sometimes, especially for metals to initially screen a site. This was the pesticide mixing area I mentioned yes, uh, the, in the previous presentation. We had a lot of historical information. We knew the site had a we knew the people before were mixing arsenic-based pesticides at the site. You've seen this historical photograph. Having difficulty finding it with uh, designating 5,000 square foot DUs as a nine acre site. So the consultant went back with a tight grid of discrete soil samples, very well prepared discrete samples. There were several points within a one square meter area, shot them with an XRF, and very quickly identified where the hot area of the site was. A, a key thing here, and something really to keep an eye out for in all your discrete sample reports, existing information. So you see these isolated hot spots and cold spots. What this means is that the heterogeneity within this area now around any given point is varying above and below your screening level, just like our lead site. So these hot spots could be entirely artificial. If you move any one of these discrete samples in this area B over a few inches or even test another pinch of soil, you know, or with an XRF soil from that same sample, and you might find concentrations of arsenic above or below the screening level. So attempting to excavate out these isolated, seemingly isolated hot spots can be completely erroneous. Whereas the same thing and once you get down to area C again, all the discrete samples came back clean. You can have pretty high confidence this is clean. But again, we would go back and collect discrete soil samples to verify the concentration of arsenic across the area. You see these uh, these random map patterns, these artificial hotspots, once you learn to recognize and understand what they are, they start popping up everywhere. This was a nine or 10 acre site, and they knew they had PCB problems here. In this case, the consultant, uh, knowing the problems with discrete soil samples, again, they intentionally went out and collected hundreds of discrete soil samples across the surface of the site. They used a cheaper amino assay kit samples uh, test just to reduce the cost again, the attempt here, idea here was to try to identify large areas of contamination, PCB contamination. And that's more or less what this, the investigation did. It looked like most of the PCB contamination was over here on the left-hand side. Then you get these isolated little hot spots out here. If you zoom in, they're based on one or maybe two discrete samples, one or two spoonfuls of dirt. Something, there are definitely PCBs in this area, but you can't really rely on what the ISO concentration map uh, contouring program predicted here. So any of these spots, any of these isolated hot spots, really aren't reliable. The small scale patterns are artificial, large scale patterns are most likely reliable. Here's the true resolution of the data for this site. It's something that I just put together. So really all you can say is on, in this area of the site, <coughs> based on the discrete sample data, it's, looks like the, it's where most of the PCB contamination is, mean concentration probably over 10 ppm. And this is just to use this for additional investigation. The green area here, all the discrete samples came up clean. <coughs> so we might be reasonably confident that there's most of the soil in this area is clean. And we have these little isolated hot spots, something going on here with PCBs, where the you can't really tell exactly what's going on or if the PCBs actually pose a problem or not. And the same thing down this area, mostly green. So we would use this information again to split the site up into, into decision units, go in and collect multi increment samples and get a better idea of the contaminant distribution concentration. So this is a slide from ITRC's ISM incremental sampling methodology webinars. This is a uh, former power plant site on Hawaii as we helped write some of the case studies for it. We're going to talk about ISM and ITRC at the very last slide of this presentation. So again at this site we designated, you know, our office actually went out several years ago and collected 30 discrete samples. We thought that we had found the main core of contamination. It matched up with the historical data pretty well. We estimated at the surface about 10,000 square feet of contaminated soil. But now we, we knew, once we started realizing how unreliable discrete soil samples were, then we were really concerned about false positives. Some of these green dots surrounding the red hot area uh, might actually be PCs in that area. So we designated CIS units. I talked about this in the previous presentation around the area. Small decision units where we thought the main spill release area was, larger decision units outside that area. And we found way more PCBs, a lot more PCB contamination across the site than we initially thought with the discrete soil sample data. So now we're estimating at least 25,000 square feet of contaminated soil at the site. This investigation is still ongoing. 
They're actually now they're going vertical and moving off site trying to determine the extent of the contamination. But now that we've we're backed away, backed off from trying to test or investigate the site literally one spoonful of time with discrete samples, you know, the next round of multi increment sample data and well thought out decision units laterally and vertically, we should be able to isolate the contamination and design a remedial a remedial action plan. Then, but discrete data works for risk assessments, right? And that's something we probably need a separate webinar on, and we'll get to at the end of this presentation. Add in some notes on reliability of, reliability of discrete samples for risk assessments. So, you know, maybe, maybe not. You know, this is, uh, again, from our lead study site. It's so what we did at the lead study site. If you remember, we had 24 grid points. We had lots of discrete samples around each grid point. So we used that, those data to calculate 95% UCLs based on different combinations of the, the data. If we took the lowest concentration of lead at each one of those 24 grid points, we get a mean of 131 ppm lead, 95% UCL of 157. So we're below Hawaii's action level of 200 ppm. We take the highest concentration of lead identified or estimated for each one of the grid points, we get a mean of 452 ppm, a 95% UCL of 559 ppm. So now suddenly the entire site fails. So which one of these is right? Well, I don't know. It probably is somewhere near the middle, maybe, assuming even those 24 points were adequate. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't. I don't really know. So this just highlights that even with a single set of discrete samples, you really, you'll never know what the field precision of those data are unless you go back and collect replicate sets of discrete samples for comparison. It's something a statistician emphasized to me is that statistics only evaluates the precision of the test employed, like a student T, Chebyshev, to evaluate the data provided. So statistical tests cannot directly verify the field representatives representativeness of a single discrete data set. So that's the biggest flaw or limitation of discrete sample data is you only have one set of data typically and you have no way to verify the field representative. Maybe it's representative, maybe it isn't. So that gets to summarize that then in 21st century enlightenment. You know, what we thought in the 1980s, and I would include myself in this picture, I started working in the early 1990s, is we really thought uh, contaminated soil is like a bowl of steamed rice, is the way I like to think about it. And what this means, you could collect any mass of sample within this bowl of white rice from any place, any mass, and sent to a laboratory, you're going to get the same number no matter where you collect it. So you only need to collect one sample from your targeted area and send it to a lab and you'll get reliable data, if, assuming it was uniform. What we know now in the 21st century is that contaminated soil is more like a bowl of fried rice. So imagine if your question was, what is, what is the concentration of peas in my bowl of fried rice? Well, the first, what's the, what's the maximum concentration of green pea in this bowl of fried rice? Well, if you could zoom in and collect a small enough particle, then you would collect a single pea. So the maximum concentration is, again, 100%, 1 million parts per million. Easy question if it's there. So Think about this, even just looking at this, contaminant concentrations can vary significantly between different discrete size masses of soil. If I was collecting discrete samples in here, concentration of P could vary, vary dramatically between individual samples. So to get a representative sample of this, it's actually pretty obvious what you need to do. First is you want to collect a big sample, <coughs> a large sample, so that it's representative of everything within your decision unit bowl. And also you want to collect that sample from lots of points within your targeted bowl. And th that way you'll collect a representative sample. Then you send that to the laboratory, they're probably going to process it. Maybe they'll grind it and puree it and then test it for peas. And then you'll get a representative concentration of peas within your bowl of fried rice. That's really the, the essence of sampling theory. Collect a large sample from a lot of points from a, a specified uh, area and volume of your media. So why did this take 30 years to figure out we're having problems with discrete samples? If, uh, if you go back and look at some of the early guidance written in the 1990s, and this one's from early 2000, guidance on environmental data verification and data validation, it, it's pretty obvious that the section on validating the laboratory analytical method used and the precision of the laboratory test itself was, was very well written. You know, it's very strong. And in the end, though, that became the main focus when we talk about data validation. The way we should be thinking of it is, from a verification standpoint, instead of just verifying the samples were collected in accordance with the work plan, which is what they said here, the key point here is to verify that the sample is representative of the targeted area. That's step number one. 
Step number two is to validate that the lab data are representative of the sample present or submitted. The problem is that in data validation, these packages we get can be very expensive. All they're doing is validating the analytical method. They're not validating that the lab data represented the sample. They're not validating that the sample is represented the target area. So these were two critical things we're always missing in our work. So you know, sometimes the laboratory would, would test duplicate samples, or in the field we might collect duplicate samples, co-located samples to compare them, and not more chances than not, more often than not, they wouldn't be identical. Sometimes they'd be radically different. So what do you do? You just take the highest concentration and run with that because you're out of money to collect additional samples, out of money and time. So all the variability we'd seen over the early first 20 years, 1980s, 90s, and early 2000s was largely ignored, just especially just due to a lack of a clear alternative and lack of a push by regulatory agencies to look into details. So that the solution is, is pretty simple. It's sampling theory. It's independent of the media used. This has been used by farmers and miners for, for decades, since the 1950s. You know, a, a farmer would never go out to the middle of a field. He's, he wants to check for nutrients, say for phosphorus, nitrogen, potassium, and just grab a random spoonful of dirt and send that to a laboratory for testing. They would collect one very large sample from lots of points within designated areas of the field. That's called a multi-increment sample. It's a key part of sampling theory. Same thing for mining. They've been using it for decades. People, food, pharmaceuticals. Really, the, as someone put it, the environmental industry is the only sampling-intensive industry around that had essentially no concept of sampling theory until very recently. But it was out there. Here's a quote from 1992. Got US EPA got its document called Preparation of, Sam of Soil Sampling Protocols. Particulate sampling theory is new to most environmental investigators, even though the techniques used to apply the theory to soil sampling, like farmers, are familiar. So why didn't this take off and get incorporated into the EPA guidance? Well, at this time in 1992, all the guidance, all the books out there were mostly still written in French. And most of the people working on EPA guidance at the time, I guess, couldn't read French. And they weren't familiar with what the farmers and the miners were doing. So by early 1992, a lot of the environmental sampling guidance had already been set in stone, unfortunately, or set in place. And we just ran with discrete soil samples for the next 20 years. <coughs> so I'm not going to get into a lot of details of sampling theory. and how you determine the mass of soil you should collect for any, you know, to test for PCBs at the part per million level or something. So some outside references and training courses. Highly recommend taking Chuck Ramsey's four-day detailed introduction to sampling theory and multi-increment sampling investigations. There's a typo there. It's not supposed to be a hyphen between multi-increment. That term is actually trademarked by Chuck. He wants to be sure that people are following sampling theory if they're going to call their samples multi-increment samples. So Chuck used to work for EPA in the 90s. He started catching on to sampling theory and went off on his own. He's been working on his own since then, assisting in development of uh, sampling guidance for food, pharmaceuticals, and other things. And we're back looking at soil contamination now. Francis Petard, French, he's the sort of the godfather of sampling theory, focuses mainly on mining. Uh, he has tried to do some environmental work. He gets he has a long advanced statistic course on a advanced statistical sampling concepts. You know, it's a focus on sampling protocols for mining exploration, but it also applies to contaminants in soil. ITRC, uh, several of us from Hawaii, part of this committee, starting in 2010, wrote some guidance called Incremental Sampling Methodology. We'll talk about it at the end. It's a a decent introduction to sampling theory basics, but it's it's getting outdated. Some of the conclusions in the in the document regarding the reliability of multi samples and such are, are incorrect. And we'll talk about the end again, but most of the people involved in writing the document, say out of 100, very few of the people had any training in sampling theory or actual experience. It's just an interesting group that got together to write some, something to get going. Over 4,000 people have joined in the ISM webinars, training seminars. <coughs> You hear lots of different terminology. We use the term MIS, multi-increment samples. Again, the trademark by Chuck Cranzi. If you use our guidance in Hawaii, you can use the term multi-increment samples. Other names you'll hear, ITRC, incremental sampling methodology. You'll hear composite sampling, incremental sampling, I think incremental composite sampling. I'll show you in a minute. Really, the term multi-increment sample is, it most accur accurately describes the sampling approach that's being used. Again, trademarked by and by stats. That's discussed in our guidance manual. We'll discuss why multi-increment samples aren't composite sampling, aren't composite samples. 
from a regulatory standpoint at the end of this presentation. They all have the same concept, kind of the same goal, just different terminology, and you have to be careful the terminology you use. Sampling theory, lots of details. Again, I'm not going to get into in detail on the details. There are a lot of potential causes of error in your data. Fundam fundamental error, just dealing with how you collect a soil sample, and mass and such, based on your target concentrations, particle size and shape and density. Uh, group and segregation error, increment delimitation deline error, you know, how you collect a sample in the field, how you actually pull a sample out of the ground, uh, how the laboratory prepares a sample, there's analytical error. So lots of sources of error in the data. This is all described under sampling theory discussed in Petard's book and summarized in our guidance in some degree in ITRC's guidance. I like to keep it simple and explain, I like to explain sampling theory with a salad. Let's assume we have some large salad. We're thinking in terms of chronic exposure concerns. Say we're, we're allergic to tomatoes over the long term. I'm not going to talk about acute toxicity at this point. So we're going to eat this entire salad over our lifetimes and we want to know we're concerned about the tomatoes in it. One well, of the wrong questions to ask is what's the maximum concentration of tomato in this salad? So what's the maximum concentration of tomato in the salad? Well, it's 100%. If you could zoom in, go in with a pair of chopsticks and pluck out a tomato and test it, it's 100 ppm tomato. So that's not a rational question, really, from a risk assessment standpoint or site investigation standpoint. Another wrong question, what is the concentration of tomato at point X? Well, we're not concerned about point X. We're concerned about long-term exposure to this t tomatoes in the salad and just like we would randomly walk back and forth across our backyard over many years and be randomly exposed to soil across the entire backyard we're not concerned about any given point we want to know what the concentration of the contaminant in this case tomato is for our decision unit as a whole so how do you do it properly then the right question is what is the true or the mean concentration of tomato in the salad so the primary concern long-term repeat exposure to tomatoes Salads to be eaten over a lifetime, just like the dirt in your backyard. So the entire salad is, is, is a, represents an exposure area decision unit. So how do you collect a representative sample of this salad then? When sampling theory, again, the idea is you collect a big sample from lots of points. Uh, fundamental error and a key part of sampling theory, you, can, you actually calculate the mass of salad or the mass of soil that you need to, to collect to get a representative sample. And this is based on, again, particle size, shape, density, the concentration, anticipated concentration of whatever it is you're looking at. And if you run this through the fundamental error equation for soil and you're focusing on the minus two millimeter fraction of soil, then your typical minimum mass of soil sample you would collect is one to two kilograms. I'm not sure what it is for salad. Step two is you collect a large sample over the entire decision unit. So again, here's our salad decision unit. Uh, a key thing too, you want to collect the increments in a very in a random but systematic method across the DU. So evenly spaced in all directions, and John will discuss this in part four of the webinar, this gives you much more reproducible data, You're not leaving gaps in it. It's really critical, the sample in addition to mass, it needs to capture and represent, or capture a representative number of hot spots and cold spots within this salad so that you end up with a representative sample. And we know from past experience, and it's written into the sampling theory books and such, that for soil in particulate matter, you need to collect a sample over a minimum of 30 points. And each point we refer to as an increment. So at each point, we're going to collect a tiny bit of salad and put that in our bowl and then go to the next increment point, collect another uh, tiny mass of salad. And we combine these all together into a single sample. If the fairly low small-scale heter heterogeneity say tomatoes within the salad so it's fairly uniform if you want, I hate to use that term you might be able to get away with 30 increment points or 30 increments to make your salad if it's highly heterogeneous like we see at our PCB sites you have to collect your sample over at least 75 points before you can reliably go back to the same site collect the sample again and get a reasonably close number so a key point here again is the number of increments required to get a representative sample is independent of the decision unit size. It could be the size of your desk, your chair, or it could be the size of a football field. Sampling theory still applies. Minimum one to two kilograms of soil collected over a minimum of 30. Actually in our office now we would use the default of closer to 40 to 50 increment points to get reproducible data. Now as your DU size increases, then you're going to have less and less certainty about heterogeneity within your DU. 
So typically, you'll, inc you'll gradually increase the number of increments as your DUs get larger. Once they start getting over an acre or several acres in size, most consultants in Hawaii are collecting 100 increment samples. While you're out there, just ensure that, as we'll talk about in a minute, your replicate data are reasonably close, so your data are reproducible. Step four, you've collected your big salad sample. Now you're going to send it to the laboratory. The laboratory does the same thing that you did in the field. First, they're going to take your sample, spread it out into a very thin layer so they have access to all of the salad. And then they're going to collect a subsample from your salad in a sort of random systematic method to in, from at least 30 points within your salad. And then that's your subsample that they'll be testing. So what this does, it preserves the field quality of the original sample. In the aliquot or subsample tested by the laboratory, now it's representative of the sample that they obtained. And the sample, again, is representative of the, the targeted area in the field. Now, under sampling theory, for you need a minimum of 10 grams of mass to get a representative subsample from, a, from soil. Now, at normal metals, the laboratory is only going to test one gram. That's too small for the, the subsample to be representative of the sample in general, even if you did collect it from lots of increment points within the subsample. This is something laboratories can easily do for everything except mercury is just bump the mass of soil they extract for testing up to 10 grams from one gram. For mercury, they just have to collect multiple subsamples, do multiple extractions, then combine the extract. Me and John will talk about this in part four. So now you've collected your, you got your data for your sample that was representative of your targeted area. How do you know it's representative? Well, the main thing is you followed the sampling theory procedures and all the, the quantitative methods to ensure the precision of a sample that build into sampling theory. But still there's going to be some concern. How do, how do you know you, uh, just to check the precision of your, uh, your test method, what you're going to do is go back to your same decision unit two more times and collect replicate samples. So in this figure, you see sample two, sample three, and you're going to collect the sample in identical methods, uh, using identical methods, collect two large samples from different points within the decision unit. So now you've got three samples, the two replicate samples. You process them, test them in the exact same method, and now you've got three analysis or three different samples. You can compare the data. So if the data come up reasonably close, then you know that the precision of your sampling method was pretty good. So that was a salad. The same thing applies to soil. Here's a, here's a decision unit was targeted for investigation. This happened to be a random ha house lot out in the middle of an agricultural field. So again, we very clearly drew a line around the decision unit, and then the X's represent increment points where 20 to 50 grams of soil were collected, same mass at each point, as marching back and forth in a grid pattern across this DU, and then combined into a single sample. So again, the minimum sample mass, one to two kilograms sample, and gets to the lab, it's carefully processed and subsampled, and then we'll shift locations of the X's and collect another two uh, samples or two replicate samples from the same DU to check the field precision of the sampling method. Now we don't have to do this for every DU. We don't, you don't need to collect replicate samples for every single decision. That's a common question. It's very similar to the, the quality control methods used in laboratories where they, they only do it for, uh, say, test one round of quality control samples for a, a batch of similar samples. It's the same thing for a testing decision. It's in our case, we test 10% of decision units at a minimum to check the precision. Here's what a multi increment sample would typically look like. We put most of our samples, put them all actually, in for non-volatile chemicals in one to two gallon heavy duty Ziploc bags and we double bag any individual sample. And this is what the laboratory receives. The laboratory gets it. They'll set it up similar to a bakery. They have used baking trays lined with, in this case, aluminum foil. Spread the sample out, let them air dry for a day or two, and then they'll take the sample, sieve it down to less than two millimeters or whatever your decision unit particle size is. You may be looking at a finer grain fraction. And then once they sieved, dried and processed the sample and sieved it, you spread the sample out into a thin pancake and then use a special tool, typically flat bottom tool, or in this case it's a core shaped tool, to collect a subsample from your spread out sample that's processed. You want to make sure that the, the subsamples you collect from each one of these small increment points evenly covers the entire thickness of your spread out sample because the fines are likely to sell to the bottom of coarser material on top. John will review this in a little more detail in the fourth session.
forth presentation. So how does the laboratory know that it did a good job subsampling, processing and subsampling your sample? So what they would do, they could test the precision of subsampling by collecting replicate subsamples from the same sample and testing each one, then comparing the difference between their subsample data. The lab's been recommending to do this for decades, but it's never been pushed by regulators. It's an added cost to the laboratory. So if regulators aren't going to push it, they weren't pushing it. But in this case, now your lab data are representative of the sample submitted. Now, grinding is another issue that we have a section in our guidance on grinding. Uh, typically, for any sample, you want to disaggregate the sample, say PCBs or whatever, maybe in a mortal pestle as needed. You have clumps of clay and such. Grinding depends on your decision and object objectives. You don't typically grind a sample to uh, assess d current direct exposure concerns. So you're going to focus on exposure to the fine grain material in a sample. You're not going to take the entire sample and grind it before you sieve it. And a, another problem with grinding samples from a direct exposure standpoint is you could increase the true bioavailability of the contaminant and overestimate the mass of bioavailable contaminant in the soil. So that's one issue to think about. A problem when the laboratory does its replicate samples, though, if, if they can't get adequate replicate sample data, then they may need to go back and grind the samples and then uh, test those, and you'll get much better reproducibility once you grind the sample because now you have very fine particles. The problem with grinding samples, the equipment's expensive, around $25,000 is for a, a puck mill grinder, and are, they are going to charge you additional money to grind the sample, something to work out, either in puck mills or ball mills. Now we're, gonna, we're not going to go into a lot of detail. You can do this. You can also collect multi-increment samples for VOCs. In this case, it's typically in the subsurface or, say, uh, side walls of excavations. It's in the subsurface cores. Here's a core going through a DU layer in the subsurface. In this case, instead of just randomly plucking out a random five-grain plug for a discrete sample within some targeted layer, you're going to collect five-gram plugs across the entire targeted layer. Uh, through this increment, where one core would be an increment through that layer. And then the, these plugs are placed in methanol in the field. So you tell the laboratory the mass of soil you plan to put into the jar. They'll put in about the same mass or volume of methanol. And then you place your soil sample in there. Send that to the laboratory for processing and testing. Now, this doesn't necessarily work in the field all the time, especially in Hawaii. It's difficult to transport methanol around. Sometimes you have to freeze individual groups of plugs or increments or samples and send it to a laboratory and they'll place it in methanol at the laboratory and analyze it. Or you can let the jar equilibrate over overnight and then draw out a sample of methanol and send that to the laboratory for testing. But anyway, the laboratory knows the mass of soil you put in the jar. They can weigh that. They'll test the methanol and they'll measure the mass of the contaminant VOC extracted that went into the methanol. So you just take the ratio of the mass of VOC extracted methanol divided by the mass of soil in the jar and there's your concentration. So we have more detailed guidance in our TGM on this, and John will talk about it in the last session. A last note on replicate data. This, in our guidance, this is how we recommend evaluating triplicate data for multi-increment samples. Again, you need a minimum of triplicates. But if you follow our sampling procedures and sampling theory and such for collecting the multi-increment samples, triplicate data are generally adequate. If the relative standard deviation between your triplicate samples is less than 35%, then that's very good precision. No adjustments to the data are required. If the relative standard deviation is 35 to 50%, now you're getting to moderate precision, a little bit less certain about the adequacy of your data for the DUs if you have multi-increment samples. It's still adequate for decision making. When you look at the safety factors built into screening levels and risk assessment, you know, a RSD of 50% really isn't that big of a deal. But we want you to discuss the likely sources of error in your report and how your data quality could have been improved in the future, just something we can learn from, so lessons learned. That typically involves making your DU smaller, collecting larger samples for more increments, and having the lab test the larger mass. When the relative standard deviation of your replicates gets to be 50 to 100 percent, now we're starting to get, to get concerned about the precision of the sampling method and the representatives of your data. So in this case, the data need to be reviewed in a site-specific environmental hazard evaluation or risk assessment. Also recommend considering the use of a 95% UCL and also adjusting all related decision unit data. So remember, we're only collecting replicate samples in 10% in of the decision units that are tested. And you, sh you need to collect replicate samples in each group of DUs that have some relation, say it's the same spill source 
or same spill scenario, same soil type, or whatever in the field. You group all your DUs for similar scenarios together, and one of those DUs, or 10% of those DUs, you're going to collect a replicate sample. But in this case, we have a high RSD for the replicate samples we collected, so we're going to have to adjust all the other DUs where we didn't adjust, where we didn't uh, collect replicate samples to reflect the lower precision. Once your relative standard deviation gets above 10%, then we're, you have really poor precision in your data. So you need to consider first having the labs retest the samples to check for laboratory error. It's rarely the case. It's usually field error. You just, your sample wasn't large enough or your DU was too large. If the, if the data are approaching an action level, then we would recommend reconsidering sampling the same area by breaking it up first into smaller disease units and increasing sample mass and the number of increments included in the sample and increasing the mass tested by the laboratory just to get better precision on the data. John will discuss this a little bit more in part four of the webinar. So to get increased resolution of the data, it's important to do this up front at your site. Again, we talked about this before, designating DUs at a size you're comfortable making a decision on. Let's say at this site, you suspect this guy was dumping most of the tomatoes in the middle of the salad. If that's the case, then you isolate the middle of the salad as a separate decision unit for testing, and you're assuming it's going to fail. So you want to keep the, the DU as small as possible, well, just so you can minimize the amount of soil, or in this case salad, that you may have to dispose of. Now, on either side of this uh, suspect spill area, then you'll designate perimeter DUs. In these areas, you're hoping that the concentration of tomatoes or PCBs in soil is going to be lower than your screening level, so lower than level of concern, and these will be flagged as clean. There's always a concern when people getting started with this, with the way MIS or DU approaches, they're going to dilute out the concentration or dilute out the contamination of the site. So it's, it's never in a consultant or an RP's interest to mix in suspect contaminated areas with assumed or suspect clean areas of soil. Chances are they're just going to flag a lot more soil for remediation than they needed to. So in practice in the field, then you know, DUs around suspect source areas are or as small as possible. So you want to isolate these suspect spill areas as much as possible to optimize remediation, minimize remediation costs. The idea of diluting out hot spots is completely against the interest of the consultant and the representative party. And again, in this case, where would you collect triplicate samples? I think John's going to talk about this again, replicate samples. Typically, you're going to collect it in the area of the site of most concern, either because that's the source area, the spill area, where you suspect most of the contamination is, and we'll be really certain of your data in that area. Or it could also be in the area where the site that poses the highest risk, say with the highest risk of exposure. Maybe it's a playground area. Even if it's not where you suspect the most contamination is, you want to be very confident of the data. So in each of those areas, you might uh, typically collect a set of triplicate replicate samples. Again, this is discussed in our this is discussed in our TGM, in our guidance manual. Now compare this to discrete samples. In the previous slide, we had three DUs. I'm collecting triplicate samples in the middle one and one on either side. So I'm sending five samples to the laboratory. Here's what I would have done in the past when I was still collecting discrete soil samples. How many samples should I collect from this salad? Well, how much money do I have for analysis? Well, I take that amount I've got for analysis in the budget that I usually have any control of as a consultant. Someone else wrote the work plan, divided by the cost per analysis, and that's how many samples I can collect. So in this example, I'm, I'm going to collect six discrete samples within this salad. So look, this is probably the size of actual discrete samples. What can I do with that data? You know, in the past, I might have tried to make isoconcentration maps and such or calculate averages. And you can see that just the limitations of this approach compared to multi increment sampling approaches. They're just too, samples are too small, they're too few, and they don't address the question asked. The question asked is what is the true concentration of tomatoes in the salad, or the mean. Here's a quick example then of, of DU MIS methods. So in this case, the, the middle area here, let's just assume it was, uh, we suspect it was contaminated with arsenic. It's going to cost a lot of money to dig this soil out and get rid of it, so we split the targeted area up into four DUs. Maybe it's about 100 uh, cubic yards, a few hundred cubic yards at most. So we try to get small DU sizes in this case, to optimize your mediation. Now, we think we know the boundary of contamination. You see it's surrounded by these perimeter DUs. And ideally, we're setting these far enough away from the contaminated area that we're hoping they'll come back clean. Within each one of these areas, then, we're going to collect a single multi-increment sample. 
So I don't show a lot of the X's. The X's represent the points where the increments were collected to prepare a single multi increment sample. It'd be the same for all the DUs. And one of the DUs within the hot area, let's say DU2, we're going to collect triplicate samples just to test the precision of our sampling approach. So you can see down here, collecting the samples with a, a uh, sampling tube. John's going to talk about the sampling methods tomorrow. You see the triplicate samples, laboratories processing them. This is actual real data from a similar site. It was arsenic. So the multi increment sample data, sample A, 140 ppm, B, 179 ppm, sample C, 135 ppm. That's great data. Very confident. If we go back to the same area again, we're going to get a very similar concentration. Relative standard deviation, 16%. 95% UCL, which we wouldn't usually use in a multi increment sampling approach anyway, but it's 192 milligrams per kilogram. We'll talk about that whole issue with UCLs at the end. So that's how this would work. Typically, to collect a multi increment sample, once you get the DUs laid out, it takes about maybe 10 or 20 minutes to collect a single sample from surface soil if it's fairly easy to, to collect. Uh, in general, we assume 45 minutes per sample and say two hours to get in and get out of a site even if you're only collecting one sample. And the two hours would get you maybe two or three samples. Uh, other than that, the, once you know the number of samples you collect, you can assume about 45 minutes to sample, and that will give you some rough idea of uh, how long it's going to take to investigate a site. The two hours plus 45 minutes to sample for every all the samples is over, say, three or so samples. Here's an example of DUMIS results for this site. Again, the uh, sure enough, most of the contamination we isolated pretty well inside. All the red is above our action levels. The yellow is above the action. It's been detected, but in this case, arsenic was below the screening level. So that DU of soil is okay. It can stay in place. Nice green perimeter. All our perimeter DUs came up clean as suspected, except on this side. We got surprised, and our outer DUs, which we hope would be clean, both came up contaminated above our screening level. So now we, we have to do another step-out investigation. But in this case, it's very well defined. It's a clear much more clear endpoint. We probably set out two more rows of perimeter DUs to the right of this, and we want to make sure the last row we set out, but we're highly confident it's going to be in clean area of the site, just so we can isolate the contamination to the smallest area as possible. Now, key point: you don't want to leave any gaps between decision units. You don't want to jump out 20 feet and set up another row of decision units, because then you have all the soil in between you haven't tested that you have to guess what to do with. So you want to make sure you're DUs abut each other and adjacent to each other without any gaps as much as possible. And you can do the same thing. I'm just showing the surface. You do the same thing at depth by splitting this side up into DU layers. You probably have to drill through the layers then, the top layers to get to the deeper layers and collect multi increment samples to estimate the vertical extent of contamination. So that subsurface decision at layers, we talked about this before, designating DUs. Again, based on your conceptual site model, you would split the site up first into uh, surface decision units, and then you would split up some or all of the surface decision units into decision unit layers to get a better vertical resolution of contamination. So again, just because a, one of your targeted DU layers is covered with additional soil doesn't mean that sampling theory doesn't apply. It still does. You need to collect at least one to two kilograms of soil from that targeted DU layer, ideally from at least 30 points or more. Now one quick point to think about, most, uh, most DU layers are, are thin slabs. When you look at the thickness of a DU layer compared to its, its width and length, it's really a slab. It's like a thin book. So it's really important when you're designating your increments or, or laying out your grid to collect increment points in a random systematic fashion that the increments are evenly spaced in all directions, so in a grid. And John will talk more about this tomorrow, some of the problems with uneven grids of uh, increments or just random increments. Now the data aren't as reproducible. Now some DUs at depth, in rare, more rare cases, they can be deeper or thicker than they are, you know, wide or long. This is an example someone just mentioned just a few days ago. A consultant called me and said, hey, we're putting in a telephone pole. We know the soil is contaminated. We need to test the soil for disposal and run T-clip and such on for hazardous waste. Pretty small area, just a, I don't know, maybe five feet by five feet or something they were going to have to excavate to put the pole in or drill out the pole. So in this case, the, the DU is deeper than it was wide. So yeah, you don't have to put in 30 borings in this case. The, the main point is collect one, two kilograms of soil from evenly spaced increments, minimum 30 increments. So in this case, maybe you can just install four borings or so, just a small 
number of borings, but then they're going to be evenly spaced apart at the surface, then you collect increments at the same spacing at depth. So you'll collect multiple increments in each one of the borings until you get ideally a total of 30 increments from your cores. Again, you s it's important to ensure even lateral and vertical spacing between your increments. That gives you much better reproducibility. Now in this case, what the consultant actually did was install three borings within, it was a really a small area, and with the idea that each core they could use as a replicate sample just to test and to see how reproducible the data from one point to another. Could they have gotten away with a single boring through this small area they're going to put in a telephone pole? Really interesting, they tested for PCBs, lead, and arsenic just by chance. There was no dump site. The RSD of the PCBs between the three samples came back 150%. So PCB concentrations were off wildly by an order of magnitude between cores where they prepared samples from the cores just a, a foot or two apart. Lead, I think the RSD was around 70%, so a little bit less variability between essentially co-located discretes or, or cores through this. And the arsenic variability was, I think, 40%, so less variability. It just shows the, the issues you have with depending on samples from individual boreholes or single borehole DGs like we talked about earlier and whether or not they're representative. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. So you really have to understand your site before you rely on that data. Now we talked about replicates already. With subsurface replicates, sometimes it's just not going to happen. There's a, for whatever reasons, you're not going to be able to put in 90 cores, collect 90 cores from a single DU, especially at an active facility, a commercial site or something where it's paved or it's a building and such. So in this case, the collecting of fuel precision replicates where you collect completely independent sets of replicate samples isn't going to happen. If that is the case, then you just need to note the limitations of your subsurface data and the, what the limitations on the field precision of the samples are. You can help, you can adjust this or kind of accommodate for these problems not being able to collect field precision replicates by simply making your DU layers thinner so that any single sample represents a smaller mass of soil. So you can divide your vertically divide the soil up into thinner layers, it doesn't matter. You're collecting, say, the samples from 30 increments, 30 cores. Just use thinner layers, collect a larger mass of soil from each layer, and then have the laboratory even test a larger mass. That'll help improve the precision of your data. Now, one issue with collecting MI samples from cores is that typically the cores, which represent increments through the layer, are far too big to combine into one single sample. So you have to collect subsamples of, the, of these increments. At, as we showed earlier, and you see in the slide on the right, here's a core increment. We're collecting subsamples of that to prepare an MI sample in general. So each, we'll have 30 of these cores. Each core through each layer represents an increment. We have to subsample that increment and then combine all the subsample plugs into a single bulk sample, again, one to two kilograms. So each increment we try to target collecting 20, 30, or 50 uh, grams of soil to combine to prepare the bulk sample. So in this case, we're introducing another source of error into the sampling process. It's in this case, we have to subsample the increments. So even if you can't collect fuel precision replicates, another thing you can do is collect three sets of subsamples from one of the DUs from every core in every DU layer. So you'll have three replicate subsample, uh, subsampling replicate samples for each uh, DU layer. So you have three samples for each DU layer, and then you compare the RSD for the uh, for these replicate samples, and it'll give you an idea of the precision of your subsampling. So that's discussed in our, in our TGM. That might have sounded a bit confusing when I was explaining it. We're just testing the subsampling precision. So I'll get to some, some last notes. That's sort of the key points for this sampling theory, explaining what the salad problems with discrete samples, how to collect multi-increment samples in the field. A lot of details in sampling theory. It, you really need to understand the details if you want to do this properly. So again, recommend taking a, a good course in sampling theory. Uh, a few last notes, the common questions that come up. Isn't it just composite sampling? And aren't discrete samples required un, under some regulations, like under TOSCA for PCBs? Uh, don't I need to collect replicate samples from every DU and calculate 95% UCLs? We talked about it a little bit. We'll discuss that again in a few minutes. Or don't I need to look for acute hot, acute hot spots within DUs with discrete samples? You know, another kind of uh, erroneous reason to collect discrete soil samples. And how do discrete MI sample data compare from the same site? So we look at one site there. 
answer the TASA question real quickly. The, the standalone use of DUMIS methods is, is now allowed under TASCA under the risk-based option in uh, 40 CFR 761.61C risk-based disposal approach. But you have to propose this up front and discuss it with EPA. In Hawaii, if your multi-increment sample for PCBs exceeds 50 ppm, you have to report to the EPA Region 9, and then EPA Region 9 would also review the work plans and look at the adequacy of the disease units for the site in addition with our office, who would have co-oversight. Let's look at some of these other questions. Isn't this just composite sampling? Definitely not, at least not in terms of TOSCA. In, under TOSCA, composite has a very specific regulatory meaning. Even under sampling theory, composite has a very specific meaning. What we've used in the field called composite samples in the past has really been improperly used is field slang. So the problem with composite samples, or one of them is there's no well-structured approach to collecting the samples to begin with. There's no consideration of sampling theory. And we'll look at another problem in a minute. But you really want to avoid reference to multi-increment samples or even ISM samples, whatever you're going to call them as composites and reports, because you can get into a lot of problems dealing with regulatory requirements on how to address composite samples. So compositing under TOSCA refers to intentional mixing of soil from potential spill areas with areas that you suspect are potentially clean. And this violates up front one a key part of TOSCA. It says no person may avoid any provision specifying a PCB concentration by intentionally diluting the PCBs unless otherwise approved. So imagine if you had PCB oil that was over 50 ppm PCBs and you had to dispose of it at a hazardous waste landfill. What you're not allowed to do under TOSCA is dilute that PCB contaminated oil with clean mineral oil and get the concentration below 50 ppm. That would violate TOSCA. Same thing in soil. Uh, same concept applies to soil. So under TOSCA, uh, remember back when they wrote TOSCA and the, the guidance to begin with, they were assuming that the concentration of PCBs within any suspect contaminated area is going to be uniform. So under TOSCA, what composite means it's the same thing. At, at this site, let's say you designate four decision units. You suspect there's some PCB contamination in this area. Maybe you think especially it's probably in here. So here's your four decision units. And the old idea of thinking a single discrete sample from each area is going to be representative of that area, including in this suspect contaminated area. So now you've got four samples you have to pay for. So what you can do under TOSCA is you can combine these samples together at the laboratory, individual discrete samples, and prepare a composite sample for those discretes. And then the laboratory only has to run one test. So instead of testing four samples, you only have to test one. Under TOSCA, you can combine up to nine discrete samples. What you're really doing and what the intent was under TOSCA is you're combining up to nine what should otherwise be independent areas for testing. That's important because under our guidelines for decisions in general, each individual decision unit has to meet your screening level. So if you're combining them together, then that's a problem. The samples together, that's a problem. Let's say you did combine these four samples together. The laboratory comes back with their composite sample and they say, well, we got a concentration of one ppm. Under TOSCA and under strict ideas of looking at composite samples, you have to assume that the maximum concentration in any one of those discrete areas, not necessarily discrete samples, but discrete DU areas, was four ppm if your composite was one ppm. Maybe the other three were clean and all the PCBs were just in one area. That's the way composite sampling works under TOSCA. So if you, and that's why multi-increment samples aren't composite samples. In reality, we're compositing DUs, not necessarily samples. This ensures that no single sampling area, as they would say in their guidance, or we would call a decision, exceeds a target cleanup level. So under, you can do the same thing in, in theory under, for, with multi-increment samples. Again, we have the same four targeted areas. We're going to collect a single sample from each area again, but instead of collecting a single increment discrete sample, now we're collecting a single multi-increment sample or a sample from many increments in the area. So now we have four individual multi-increment samples and we're going to send these to lab and we have to pay for four analysis. But in theory, you could combine all these four samples together, have them processed as, and test as a single sample and then just assume, say you got one ppm PCBs again, that the, one of the samples could have been four ppm PCBs. So you, what you have to do is you have to multiply your sample data from the laboratory by the number of decision units included in the composite. Not necessarily the samples, just represent the decision units. 
But no one would ever do this with mold enactment samples. We definitely don't allow it in our guidance, and it would be a really silly, amazing waste of time. A key thing with mold enactment sampling approaches you probably already picked up is you're sending a lot fewer samples to the laboratory. Typically for a standard investigation, maybe 5, 10, or even 15 samples to a laboratory instead of dozens or hundreds of samples. So you're really reducing your analytical cost up front, and it would be really stupid to be blunt to combine mold enactment samples or composite them into a single sample for testing and multiply the resulting data by the number of MI samples, the number of DUs included in it. So it's not allowed. Don't do it. Compositing isn't allowed under multi increment sample sampling approaches. And multi increment samples, even incremental ISM samples, in under sampling theory and definitely under tossing regulations, are not composite samples. So last notes uh, with 95% UCLs and quantification of discrete versus multi increment state multi-increment sample data precision. This sample, this idea comes up, or issue comes up with risk assessors. And we, I think we do need a separate webinar just for MIS for risk assessors. So let's think back now, why do we ever start using a 95% UCL to begin with, with discrete samples? So again, under discrete samples, the, each individual sample is never, or not intended to represent the DU area mean. So instead, we use statistical tests, students T, Chebyshev, Chebyshev, which used to address distributional heterogeneity within the discrete sample set and estimate the mean. Now, if you read back, look back at the early guidance, they knew this method had a lot of limitations on it. How many samples should I collect? How do I know the data set are representative? So up front, they recommended uh, looking at the variability and then using the 95% UCL of the mean to address distributional heterogeneity within your single data set in your single set of sample points within that DU. That's employed for risk assessment. You can improve the precision of this statistical test by increasing the number of sample points, but this is rarely done. There are equations to do this in ProUCL and other programs. It's rarely done. Sometimes the equation says you need to collect dozens or hundreds of samples, but you're out of time and out of money. So typically, what do you do? You just take the maximum concentration of your set if your UCL is above the maximum, which it usually is and try to make some call on that, which is, is a definitely not a proper science-based method to do it. And there's also very little to no consideration of sampling theory in the collection of discrete samples. That also adds to the reliability of a, a data set based on discrete samples. This includes minimum mass and such. How you collected the sample is rarely considered. You're just looking at a table of numbers from the risk assessor standpoint. You have no idea really how those samples were collected. And again, the key point, with these statistical tests, the, they only test, only evaluate the precision of the statistical tests employed to estimate the mean for the single data set provided. You have no idea really what the field precision is, at least directly, of that single data set you collected. You, know, you collect eight samples, 10 samples, 15 samples, 20 samples, 30 samples. Even then, unless you have replicate data to compare it to, or at least similar sites to compare it to, and you're very standardized method collecting samples, you really don't know what the field precision is. Someone could go back to the same site, collect another set independent of uh, discrete samples, and you get a completely different mean in 95% UCL. That's always been a limitation with discrete samples. Another big issue with discrete sample data is the idea of what do you do with these outlier data, the really high concentration uh, for discrete samples. Very typically, they're often ignored just to force your data set to meet some uh, artificial RSD for the site. From a field sampling, field standpoint, the, the field people always had a big problem with this. They say I'm testing your backyards in one, your backyard in one of the samples, a discrete soil sample. I got really high concentrations of PCB, and now suddenly the risk assessor, not really or the statistician or someone, probably the manager, is telling me just to toss that sample point out because the RSD is too high. Well, I know I collected that sample. I know that area of the yard has high PCBs. From risk standpoint, that never made sense. Deleting outlier data is your kid is going to be wandering through that part of the yard at some point. It's a real data. Look back at some of the original guidance. You know, different groups preparing this guidance. They knew this in 1989 guidance methods for evaluating the attainment of cleanup standards. All data not known to be an error should be considered valid. High concentrations are a particular concern for their potential health and environmental impact. So again, you, you can't exclude outlier data. And uh, Petard, in his 2009 paper, a common error he's talking about the environmental industry has been to reject outlier data that cannot be made to fit a statistical model. The tendency has been made to 
the tendency has been to make the data fit a preconceived model instead of searching for a more appropriate way to collect samples, which is what multi increment samples are intended to address. I like to say, back to my geology days, gold miners love outliers. Imagine you're exploring for gold and you go out and collect discrete rock samples or soil samples, which miners would never do. They're very aware of the limitations of discrete samples. Let's say you did, one of the samples came back 100% gold. Would you really toss that sample out in assessing the economic viability of that ore deposit? I can assure, I tell you very high confidence you'd be fired in a heartbeat if you did. So no one would ever in the mining industry or even the agriculture industry would toss out outliers. The, the whole idea is to capture and represent uh, these outlier hot spots and cold spots within your sample so you collect a representative sample of your targeted area. And again, that, they're what often drive decision making and risk assessment. So the problem isn't with the statistics. And a lot of statisticians I know, including the authors of Pro UCL, tell me they get they get dumped on with bad data sets all the time and said, make some make some sense of this discrete data set I have. And what can they do? They say, well, I can eliminate the outliers. You tell me if it's justified or not, and I give you lower RSD. But it's really, it's not the statisticians. It's not even the risk assessors. It's the people like myself in the past who were collecting the samples in the field in the first place and collecting the wrong type of data to give to risk assessors and the statisticians. So excavating, what, so you're stuck with these outliers. You can't ignore them. Well, another thing we've done in the past, I know it's still done quite a bit, let's just excavate out the hot spot that we found with our one set of discrete samples. Back to our lead site here, so we've got these red areas here, hot lead, based on discrete samples. We'll go through and excavate all the, out all these red areas, and then we're done, right? Excavate those out, recalculate a mean for the site, there's our exposure concentration. Well, guess what? You go back to the same site, set a, collect a different set of discrete samples from the same grid points like we talked about before, and all of a sudden you have a completely different pattern of contamination in the area. So excavating out hot spots based on discrete soil sample data can be highly misleading and erroneous. Really, if you do that, which in some cases you do, you might screen a site using discrete data, excavate out a hot area, but if you do that, you need to go back and completely resample the entire site. In this case, you do it MI samples just to verify the contaminant concentrations. If you go back with discrete data, you'll see you think you excavated out everything. Somebody will go back a few years later, test the same site, and big surprise, they're finding more hot spots. So these are all just due to the artificial nature of discrete sample data. That one thing that leads on to then, so we're stuck with these hot spots, well, shouldn't we use discrete samples to look for acute hot spots within a targeted area, like within your front yard? But what you're saying in this case is your decision unit is a very small volume of soil. Th these acute hot spots, that's your decision unit. It's not your entire yard. It's small bits of soil within that yard. So let's think about that. Here's a front yard and feasibility of this. Here's a front yard, 20 feet by 20 feet. Here's an example regulatory requirement. I know several states are thinking about this. So no single discrete sample, soil sample in the upper three inches of soil shall exceed 400 milligrams per kilogram lead due to short-term risk. So a kid eating just you know, one small mass of soil at one time might shoot his blood level up, level up too high or a few of these over a few day period. So think about this in detail. What are we really talking about here looking for? So the total mass of soil in this front yard, 20 by 20 feet, top three inches, about 3,000 kilograms, about 3 million grams. So what's your decision unit? What's your DU? Well, individual discrete samples is about 100 grams, fit in a four ounce jar. In this case, your front yard has 30,000 potential DUs in it. How many of those DUs do you need to test to demonstrate that no single discrete sample, no single 100 gram mass of soil within my front yard exceeds 400 ppm? Well, it's gonna be a lot, and you're never gonna do that with a typical discrete investigation method. You're not gonna have the money or the time. And really, what does 100 grams mean? That has nothing to do with risk. It just happens to be the size of a jar you put your dirt in, or the amount of dirt you typically put in a four-ounce jar. So how about the mass of lab test anyway? Because the sample data they give you back isn't representative of that 100 grams. It's only representative of one gram they test. Now you're suddenly dealing with 3 million potential acute size decision unit mass of soil in your front yard. Well, good luck with that. How many of those do you need to test to demonstrate with any degree of confidence that no single one gram mass of soil exceeds 400 ppm. It's, you'll never do it. But these, none of these have to do with risk. Let's think about it in terms of risk. The default child soil ingestion rate is 200 milligrams a day. So that's starting to get reasonable in terms of risk, at least, talking about decision units. 
Now you have 15 million potential decision units in your front yard. How many of those 15 million do you, use, do you need to test to prove that no 200 gram mass of soil that some kid's gonna accidentally eat in the front yard exceeds 400 million, 400 ppm lead? Uh, good luck with that. So really we're talking about chronic risk here. In reality, if we're worried about acute exposure, we should be thinking of pica kids, pica children, kids who eat dirt. The default soil ingestion rate is about a small spoonful of dirt, 10 grams. So this is a much more reasonable acute size, uh, ex acute exposure area volume of soil, exposure volume of soil. But in this case still, now we're, we have 300,000 potential DUs, one, 10 gram DUs in this front yard. How many of those do you need to test to get any confidence again that none of those 10 grams of soil exceed 400 milligrams per kilogram lead? Well, you're never going to do it. You could do... You collect 59 10-gram masses of soil to have them test the entire 10 grams, and you can be 95% sure that 95% of the other, what, 299,000 or whatever, 10-gram uh, masses you didn't test don't exceed 400 ppm. Uh, no one's ever going to do that in reality. So in reality, if you're worried about acute concerns, uh, point number one is acute soil screening levels don't exist for most contaminants. The, EPA's regional screening levels, Hawaii's action levels, California's screening levels, they're all based on acute risk, where you're looking at the mean true concentration for very large areas. That's where multi kit sampling comes in play. So there are no acute soil screening levels for most contaminants. The only one where there might be is potentially for lead, like we're using up here. So if that's the case, it's not feasible to negate the presence of any small mass of acutely toxic soil, say with lead, with any degree of confidence based on the soil data. You have to do a visual check of the yard and use a metal detector, maybe do soil washing, trying to pull out bits of lead paint or lead shot. But in the end, if you're concerned about, you know, some 10 gram mass of soil or a piece of lead shot the size of BB in your yard, if you're really concerned about that from an acute toxicity standpoint, all you can do is scrape the site or cap the site. You'll never be able to verify that with soil data. And then you would evaluate chronic risk with multi increment samples. Now the assumption has been in the past I think would still hold up is that if this front yard passes for chronic risk, maybe anything except lead, then it would also pass for this hypothetical acute risk if we happen to have toxicity factors for some contaminant in the front yard or in your DU. That's something else we can discuss more in uh, MIS for risk assessment. Let's compare this. It's really apples and oranges I showed here if you caught that. Let's compare this to how we quantify the precision of uh, multi increment sample data. In this case, the individual samples were in specifically designed to represent or to reflect your DU area mean. So the quantification of precision is built into the sample collection and processing method. This is sampling theory, fundamental error that we already talked about. So, so the quantification of precision is already built into how you're collecting the samples in the field. So how do you test that? The precision of a sampling method is, a, is tested, addressed by testing, again, Replicates from a minimum 10% of related seed units have similar spill scenarios, soil types, uh, contaminant types, and such. So you're going to collect, say, one set of triplicate samples from 10% of the DUs, and then compare the data, and this will give you the sum of field plus laboratory area. Again, very similar to laboratory uh, quality control methods for batches of samples to test analytical method precision. Now, you can calculate a 95% UCL for triplicate samples, but this 95% UCL is very different from a 95% UCL that was recommended, even required for single sets of discrete samples. For discrete samples, the 95% UCL is used to address heterogeneity within a decision unit of individ between individual points. In MI samples, this heterogeneity is addressed through sampling theory and collecting multi-increment samples of proper mass, properly extracted, properly processed and all. So that's the difference. Discrete 95% UCL is used to address heterogeneity between individual points, multi increment samples. Sampling theory is used to address heterogeneity between individual increment points. This 95% UCL that you can calculate from a set of triplicate data, is, it's an add-on add to testing the precision of your data. In this case, now you're looking also addressing field precision. That's really the main thing it's going to be addressing anyway is a closer look at the field precision of your sample data. So it's very different from a discrete 95% UCL. And you can improve the precision of your sampling method for MI sampling methods by reducing DU size, increasing sample mass, or increasing the number of 
increments, increasing sample mass tested by laboratory and such. Now, as we discussed before, we only start to consider the 95% UCL for multi increment sample data when your relative standard deviation, or really when your field error, error gets to be above 50%. That's when we we'll start con uh, recommending consideration of 95% UCL again. Because again, like in discrete data, single data sets, we're starting to be more concerned about the representatives that, of the sampling approach. So here's an example of the data. Each one of these study sites, we actually collected triplicate multi increment samples from the same study area. So compare this to what you might get for discrete data from the same area. At the arsenic site, three different samples, 54 increments per sample, sample ABC, 220, 250, 230 milligrams per kilogram. Excellent precision, relative standard deviation, 6.5%, mean 233 ppm. Very confident these data representative a single sample would have been fine for use in a risk assessment. Lead site, same number of increments, sample ABC, 270, or 240, 270, and 350 milligrams per kilogram. Again, very tight, considering the potential for field area. Field area, the RSD, 20%, mean 287 ppm. Again, RSD less than 35%, a single sample would have been fine for this area and for any other DUs tested around here, similar scenario. Similar sampling approach will go with a single MI sample for each DU without needing to adjust the data. How about the PCB site? I start with sample B and C. Sample B, 24 ppm. Sample C, 19 ppm. A 60 increment sample collected over 5,000 square foot area. So we're thinking, wow, this is really good. We got amazingly good precision for PCBs. Sample A, 270 ppm PCBs. RSC, 138%. You can get a mean 143 ppm. Yeah, that might be close. This represents a 90-point uh, sample within that same area. But RSD is way too high. We really know we can't trust any individual discrete sample data set. This was a surprise. I actually collected these samples. The, of course, the first thing I did as the field person, I blamed the laboratory. I actually paid out of my own pocket, had the laboratory retest all three samples, because surely this was field error. They got one of these little nuggets in their sample. They didn't process the sample back. Their rep, their repeated all the samples, came back with almost exact same numbers. So this was field error. We just, we need, we didn't collect enough increments within this area. The main thing was our decision it was too large. We knew that one part of this area was more contaminated with PCBs than the other. So up front we should have set really small decision units, that's key for PCBs, high heterogeneity, and collected more increments from smaller DUs and collected larger sample mass. So I'll end up here, this has gone on for a while, but it's, let's see, Let's compare some data where we have both discrete sample data and multi increment sample data from the same site. This is where a multi increment sample methods first got started in Hawaii. John Peard was, when he first came here, he was testing this site, four acres. They collected, we hadn't started looking at multi increment samples yet, collected about 15 discrete samples, and the data were all over the place, even near side by side samples. So he did what any of us would have done. We collected more discrete samples, and the more he collected, the worse it got. You can see here this point, 1300 ppm, just a few feet away, 2.5 ppm. At the same time, Chuck Ramsey was in Hawaii teaching a sampling theory class for sampling surface water that John happened to take. And he realized, and of course Chuck knew this already, hey, we should use something similar for soil. So we went back to the same site and split it up into decision units. And split up into four decision units based on uh, based on the discrete data where it looked like there was higher concentrations of arsenic in some areas than others, and also on how the site was going to be redeveloped for exposure area type decision units. And here's what they got there. multi increment samples, DU, D, A, B, C, D, 906 ppm in D, uh, DUA, 275 ppm, DUC, 491 ppm, DUB, 300 ppm. I think these, these might have been 30, 40, 50 increment samples. I'm not really sure. MIS, triplicate data, triplicate samples collected in DUD, 9.5%, just excellent. So we know we have very good sampling precision and that a single sample would have been very representative of any of these DUs. Now, we also have discrete data for these same DU areas, typically 12 to 16 samples per DU, which is according to ProUCL and some state guidance is fine for calculating means and such. So DUD, the discrete mean, 685 ppm, lower than MIS sample. 95% UCL, 928, which is getting better. This shows why you should use the 95% UCLs if you're relying on discretes. RSD, 81%, so not a lot of confidence. The risk assessment wouldn't have in this data. 
I'm sure if Pro UCL other programs would recommend collecting more samples. So let's look at, at all these DUs. One thing to notice, DUA, MIS-275, discrete mean 168, DU, let's look at DUC, MIS-491, discrete mean 397. We see this all the time. The mean of discrete samples is very typically lower than the MIS sample, and that's because the discrete samples are missing hot spots. You're testing fewer areas with discrete samples typically. You're not collecting the samples properly, and you're going to end up missing hot spots. You're going to get a lower mean. So the the 95% UCLs also in these A and B for the discrete samples, a lot higher than the MIS. And the MIS, we have a lot of confidence in. Let's look at how high that is, 529 versus 225, RST 87. No confidence at all in this UCL. You might think it's conservative, but if you're having to pay for the cleanup here and your screening level is 200 ppm, you probably think otherwise. Same thing for DUC, the UCL far higher than the MI. Uh, concentration, RSD 91%. Then look at uh, DUB, where the, the mean concentration of, of arsenic based on the discrete samples here, I think the 12, 16 samples, 367 ppm, actually higher than the MI sample. And that'll happen every now and then. Typically it's going to be less, and some kind of times it's higher, but look at the RSD, 151%, 95% UCL, 1,962 ppm, and the highest so, you know, the discrete data here are just not useful for making decisions. That gives you an idea of the, the problems with discrete sample data just for risk assessment with just a single set of, of samples. Typically, the mean is going to underestimate the true mean, and your RSD very often is going to be high, but you don't have any money to collect additional samples. So you, you typically consult us a lot of times you just go with the highest concentration of DU, which really defeats the whole purpose. So that's, that's pretty much it. A key point here is multi-anglet samples this whole DUMIS approach, it's not just another tool in the toolbox. And that's a, a misconception that can come across in ITRC's ISM guidance. Because at the time, very few people on that team, I'll mention in a minute, had any experience in MIS or sampling theory. So the whole approach in part was sort of a, presented as an alternative. Maybe it's a good ISM sites and discretes are good at others. That's not the case at all. This whole DUMIS approach, even ISM approach, they were developed to specifically developed to address well-known serious deficiencies in these traditional soil, discrete soil sampling methods. So it's a new set of tools. It's not another tool in the toolbox. It's something entirely new to improve the way we're doing things, make it more efficient. Last note, last slide, quick notes on uh, ITRC's incremental sampling methodology guidance. Uh, again, two or three of us from Hawaii were on this team starting in 2010. There are about 100 people on the team. You know, the dot finished and published in 2012. So it, it gives a decent basic introduction to sampling theory. But it's key thing to remember, very few of the team members of the 100 plus original team members had any training at all in sampling theory or any experience in the collection of ISM or multi-increment samples in the field. They were very interested in what was going on and learn more about it, but not much experience. So the, the document really lacks a, a detailed review of appropriate sample mass, number of increments, and field implementation, especially of, of a, what they call incremental sampling methods. And a key thing, too, is a statistical evaluation of ISM data in the appendices to the document. It's important to keep in mind at that time we didn't have a, a real set of field data to think about and to work with. So that's an entirely artificial database, computer generated. So some of the conclusions regarding the precision of multi increment sample data under predicting means and such are, are really completely erroneous. It's, it, was, it was an idea, that's all we had at the time, to develop the guidance. But it's, now we have a better set of data to think more about. And the precision of an ISM sample, MI sample, uh, it can vary completely on how the sample is collected, how your DUs are designated. So there's no set idea of what time it might underpredict, percent of time it might underpredict the true mean or overpredict the true mean. The key is to follow sampling theory to collect a proper sample to begin with. So, also, the, a key thing in this document, too, is it lacks a critical review of discrete sample reliability. Again, we didn't have the data uh, data set like we do now to review and think about more details of li the reliability of discrete samples and including them in risk assessments. So that's it, uh, a longish review of sampling theory, but I wanted to get a lot of notes down and ideas. I'll, a lot of this is in our TGM guidance. And again, take Chuck Ramsey's class or read Francis Fattar's sampling theory book. The last and final presentation. Now we finally get out into the field to collect samples. It's uh, part four, TGM section five. 
Dr. John Peart will be presenting that in the next presentation. And again, all these presentations, uh, as you can tell now, are being recorded, presented to the web, uh, uh, posted to our YouTube station, and we'll be posting sample uh, questions and responses to questions as part of those postings. So thanks again for joining us.